We're moving now to our uh, second uh, part of this panel, which will be um, Rebecca Reifman from the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at University of Haifa, and Nona Kushnirovich, Department of Economics and Management at the Ruprin Academic Center. I will say that in the Israeli context, anyone working on BLA, these two women do not need, uh, these two scholars do not need any uh, introductions because they are the um, Bible of BLAs. They've been following the Israeli BLAs and researching it extensively, so we're very grateful that they're here with us. And they're going to be talking about uh, bilateral agreements, precarious work, and the vulnerability of migrant workers in Israel. Uh, yeah. Jenna Hennerby is then going to discuss, but now uh, Rebecca and Nana, I move it to you. Could you make me co-host? Because I will Yes, come on. Can you do that? I have, a, I have already. Uh, so okay. you should be able to hear me. Okay. 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 So, uh, uh, thank you, Ila, for your presentation. Indeed, uh, we have been conducting a um, long study uh, about the effect of bilateral agreements. Actually, we started with the um, comprehensive research on the migration industry before the bilateral agreements, be before we believe even that this could happen. So um, uh, what we are going to uh, present today is uh, about, we are going to examine the impact of bilateral agreements on the migrants workers vulnerability during the recruitment process and during their employment in Israel and uh, we are going to focus on migrant workers from Thailand in agriculture and Chinese workers in construction because for these two groups, we have data before uh, and after. Uh, and you can see that agricultural construction uh, comprise about 38% of all migrant workers in Israel. Um, we are, as I said, we are going to focus not only on the impact on recruitment issues, but also on the protection of migrant rights. Although the bilateral agreements in Israel focus only, mainly on recruitment issues, uh, they do not deal with the protection of migrant rights, but uh, they are intended to raise uh, migrants' awareness about their rights, more information during the recruitment process, uh, more transparency, orientations before departure, call centers, uh, also low levels of, of deaths after the uh, by implementation of bilateral agreement. So we can assume an indirect effect on employment conditions. So uh, before the signing of the bilateral agreements, the official recruitment in Israel was conducted through private recruiting agencies in Israel in the countries of origin, in 2006, a maximum recruitment fee of about $1,000 was set for potential migrant workers, but private companies continue to collect much higher fees. Uh, and uh, on our first study, uh, where we map the migration industry uh, um, in Israel and their connections with other uh, countries, uh, the average for um, care worker was about $7,000, for um, um, agricultural worker $9,000, for a Chinese worker coming to work in construction, it was about $20,000 on average, but we found people that even paid $30,000. Uh, in 2005, the government announced that in order to put an end to these corrupt practices, the recruitment of migrant workers would be conducted under the supervision of international Organization for Migration or another public organization. But uh, the first BLA with Thailand was signed only in 2010 and implemented in 2012. And after the uh, signing of the first bilateral agreement, you see that uh, Israel signed several bilateral agreements, uh, Bulgaria, Moldova, Romania, uh, these are migrant workers coming after the bilateral agreement. So we don't, do not have data for them before the bilateral agreement. Uh, for care workers uh, from the Philippines, Nepal, and Sri Lanka, there are 
uh, new signed uh, bilateral agreements that are not being implemented. So for uh, in, two, uh, in 2020, 91% of migrant workers in construction sector and all the workers in the agricultural sector are now coming under the bilateral agreements. Uh, regarding social rights uh, of migrant workers, uh, in Israel, migrant workers are entitled to the same minimal working conditions as Israel employees, minimum wage, one day off a week, overtime payment, not in care work, uh, paid annual vacation, sick pay, and our migrant workers are, are only partly covered by the system of social security. They are all not entitled to social health insurance, but the employer has to provide private health insurance and the employer has to provide my young workers with proper housing. So, but despite the existence of these laws, workers' rights are violated. So uh, in order uh, to examine uh, the before and after, okay, implementation of the a bilateral agreement and their uh, effect on migrants workers uh, rights during the recruitment process and in, in the employment. We developed the vulnerability index of migrant workers and we regard the precariousness or vulnerability of labor migrants as a continuum of, of experiences and situations ranging from the positive extreme of decent work, the desirable situation, to the negative extreme of serious forms of exploitation. And using this continuum, we can evaluate the situation of migrant workers against the goals of a decent work, protected rights, adequate remuneration, and uh, social protection. So uh, these are the dimensions and indicators of precariousness and vulnerability in the literature. So uh, we, um, we have literature dealing in general with precarious work in the labor market a literature that makes the connection, the connection between precarious work and uh, labor migration. Uh, these authors are marked in color in, the, uh, in this uh, table. Um, and um, you see that uh, we have dimensions related to um, uh, working conditions, uh, um, also um, living conditions, and also uh, we have an, a dimension connected to dependency or dependence on migration cost. Okay, so we are adding this dimension on our index of uh, vulnerability. Uh, uh, the data was collected uh, through surveys. Uh, the first one was, was a very um, large um, 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 questionnaire we also had uh, open questions that help us to learn a lot about all the process of recruitment, all, all the actors involved and uh, the way uh, migrants um, contacted these agencies. Uh, and uh, we were lucky to have this uh, study conducted before we even uh, dream about the implementation of, of uh, the BLA. So uh, we have uh, 180 workers from Thailand, uh, 55 before the bilateral agreement, the rest uh, after the bilateral agreement, because we uh, follow monitoring uh, what happened with the recruitment proce process and employment conditions uh, during several years. And then uh, we have uh, 78 workers from China, 32 before the bilateral agreement and 46 after the bilateral agreement. Uh, and uh, these studies were funded by the uh, CIMI, the Center for International Migration and Integration, that is also is an NGO that is also involved in uh, the implementation of um, the bilateral agreements. So now Nona will continue with the presentation. Okay, I will continue. Um, I will describe uh, how we developed uh, the, the index of vulnerability uh, of migrant workers. It included five sub dimensions poor working conditions, living conditions, safety conditions, low wages, and dependence on migration costs. Um, 
the first dimension, poor working conditions, included the long working hours, calculated as a daily hours of work, not paying for overtime, not paying for overtime and not paying for sick days, were calculated as the percentages of workers who reported not receiving these payments, not rest days. It uh, was measured uh, by the number of rest days per month that the workers didn't take, uh, willingly or unwillingly. Contract violations uh, were calculated as the percentage of uh, workers who reported a lack of correspondence between the contracts and the actual employment conditions. I don't want to go through all the items. I will explain only about the last one, dependence on migration costs. It included a level of indebtedness. It was measured uh, as a, a percentage of the total migration costs financed by loans. Um, time to repay the debt in month and the total migration costs in dollars. Uh, so all of these indicators had different scales, dollars, days, percentages, uh, and to convert them uh, to the same scale of zero to 100, we used the following formula. Uh, and we received uh, the index of vulnerability, we calculated it as uh, um, the average values uh, of the adjusted uh, variables. High values indicate higher level of vulnerability. Um, this slide shows uh, uh, the characteristics of uh, migrant workers. I don't want to go into the details because we don't have the time. Uh, this slide shows the index uh, of vulnerability of Chinese workers. As Rivka said, um, we have uh, unique data because we survived migrant workers before and after implementation of the bilateral agreements. So you can see here two columns, uh, before and after. Uh, and here you can see uh, dimensions, five dimensions of the index and uh, the separated indicators. You can see that after the implementation uh, of the bilateral agreements, almost all indicators of working conditions were higher, namely they worsened. There was not significant change in living conditions and as to safety conditions, the situation with the receiving safety instructions worsened and um, the situation with protective gear improved. Wages deteriorated significantly, namely after the bilateral agreement, the wages of the Chinese workers were much closer to the minimum wage stipulated by law. Uh, but the last indicator, uh, dependence on migration costs, uh, improved significantly. Before the agreement, uh, as Rivka uh, said, the workers paid uh, on average $22,000. And after the agreement, they the total costs of migration decreased to $1,535. So from $22,000 to $1,500. And uh, correspondingly, the workers borrowed less and indebtedness and time to repay the debt decreased. It's important to say that for Chinese workers, we examined only the short time change um, because uh, the agreement was implemented in 2017 and we interviewed the workers in 2018. But... Uh, no, no, I will uh, there's a lot of interesting information, but we will have to wrap up soon. So I'm just... I know, I know. <laughs> this is the one slide before the conclusions. <laughs> um, for uh, Thai workers, we examine the consequences 
uh, both in the short run and in the long run. Namely, uh, uh, more than five years after the uh, implementation of the bilateral agreement. Uh, here you see three kinds of columns before, uh, just after the implementations, right after, and uh, uh, you can see also the long term change after five years. So we can see here an interesting tendency. Right after the implementation of the bilateral agreements, some indicators showed improvement. For example, this one and this one, this one, many of them, but um, in the long run, after five years, most of the indicators increased, namely, uh, the, uh, there was deterioration. Uh, you can see that green columns are higher than the light blue columns. And sometimes they became even worse than they were before the bilateral agreement. For example, for not paying for sick days or for contract violations. Uh, but as for Chinese workers, the index of the dependence on migration costs significantly improved. Migration costs paid by Thai workers decreased from $9,000 to $2,000. And the time required to repay the debt and indebtedness are also dropped down. So I move into the conclusions. After implementation of the bilateral agreements, the total index of vulnerability showed improvement. We attribute this improvement to the dramatic decrease in dependence on migration costs. This improvement was accompanied by significant reduction in the migration workers' relative wages. After the bilateral agreements, the wages were closer to the minimal level uh, than before. And this decrease was maintained in both the short and long terms. The bilateral agreements didn't significantly improve the migrants' working and living conditions. For Chinese workers, they worsened in the short term. And for Thai workers, uh, there was a slight improvement in the short term and deterioration in the long term. So in sum, under, the, uh, under conditions of precarious employment, governance may be very effective in one field, but lead to deterioration of other fields. And I don't know whether I have the time, uh, I have some explanation uh, for it. Um, as Rivka said, the bilateral agreements it focused uh, only recruitment process and didn't include requirements um, to a protection of uh, workers' rights. Um, they are intended to raise the awareness about the rights and increased awareness should indirectly affect employment conditions by causing workers to stand up for their rights and speak uh, out against the violations. But in spite of it, a greater awareness uh, in spite of great awareness of migrant workers, we uh, didn't find any impact on the general precariousness of the employment conditions. Thank you very much. Thank you very <laughs> much, Nona and Rivka. Um, we now turn to your uh, discussions. Um, so Jenna, Jenna Hennerby, uh, that we all heard her fascinating work yesterday uh, will be uh, talking, will be uh, presenting now. Jenna is from the Wilfrid Laurier, Laurier University in Canada. Hi, hi again, folks. Um, been a fascinating uh, period of time. Uh, enjoyed listening and, and learning along the way. Thank you. Um, I also enjoyed reading this paper and hearing your presentation. Um, 
as is the case for many of us researchers, we really get in into the, the weeds of the data and of the issues. And it was really nice to sort of uh, be embedded in that when I was reading your, your work in this context that I've not done work in. So I was really enjoying that. So thank you. Also want to say it's, you know, very detailed, very thorough, so much information in there and uh, clearly evident how well you know this context um, and, and very valuable uh, contribution in, in that regard. Also really liked the, the way uh, the analysis was able to uh, unpack and think of um, labor migration in the context of, you know, comparing across sectors um, is really important. I think we sometimes get caught in a in one sector that we're working in. It's really good to think comparatively and obviously to recognize that there are very different realities in the sector as the differences between agriculture uh, and the kind of heightened vulnerabilities to health issues uh, that workers might face in agriculture versus the heightened vulnerabilities that workers might face in another sector, um, whether it be construction or whether it be um, something, some of the else like domestic work. Um, and so it's good to start thinking uh, comparative sectorally and, and that's something that I found really valuable about this paper. In addition, I really like the uh, pre and post bilateral agreement framing. And I was sort of jealous um, because, <laughs> um, you know, identifying that case and being able to work with that to sort of feel that reach workers before an agreement happens and after. And, and it's a challenge too, right? So figuring out causality there is a little sketchy, but uh, you've done a really good job at trying to make some comparative links and, and look before and after and see what things have changed and, and what have stayed the same. And I think that's very powerful in terms of our discussion around uh, how, like, you know, what does uh, bilateral agreements, what do bilateral agreements do and for whom, you know? <laughs> uh, and I think that's a really Im important um, measure of that. I will say though that, uh, that I think uh, I have a few comments that maybe could help in some of that uh, comparison. Uh, and then also um, some thoughts around your uh, vulnerability index that I wanna share. So, um, and, and then uh, a few other thoughts as I go. They're a little bit all over the place. So bear with me, I'll just sort of say a few of them and then hopefully in discussion, uh, we, can, we can continue up uh, with this. So, um, I think the grappling with precarity versus vulnerability is is something that um, a lot of scholars have done. You've identified many of those, such as uh, Lewin Goldring in Canada and, and others um, internationally as well. I think that you know you've you've clearly uh, started with that work and and had it inform your creation of your vulnerability index. But I think um, I'm I was grappling with as I was reading the paper, feeling like maybe you still need to pull out a little bit more of that differentiation. So what in your mind is the difference between precarity and vulnerability? Sometimes they're used interchangeably and I don't think they are. And I think it's good to try to unpack what you mean there. Uh, and, and and I think it'll strengthen your 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 argument more. And I think if and historically, the use of vulnerability has been tied to vulnerability to something, right? To particular kinds of risks. So health risks in particular is often where vulnerability is tied. Also to extreme exploitation and abuse, right? We might talk about being in vulnerable situations or vulnerable to. And precarity, meaning, uh, you know, having a, a, a work and a status that is on the edge that could change and could be revoked or isn't stable, right? That's really how precarity has been, um, been operationalized in, in previous work. So I think you wanna, uh, I think it could strengthen your work to further operationalize this idea of vulnerability, right? And vulnerability to what uh, explicitly, right? Um, and I think where you're kind of headed is vulnerability to rights violations, um, I think is where you're, you're headed more so. So um, uh, making some of that more explicit might be uh, a way to, to further strengthen it. Other things I've been thinking about um, are, ways to, in your vulnerability index, um, to include more structural dimensions of uh, vulnerability that have historically been extremely important uh, in uh, impacting people's abilities um, to claim rights and uh, protect their rights. Um, so uh, social determinants of health, for example, uh, race, 
um, gender, um, these underlying uh, factors that actually are quite important to being able to claim rights or not. Um, and so, um, so I think finding a way to integrate those factors, I think could, could further strengthen it. Um, was also wondering a little bit more if you could expand more and maybe, you know, when you pull together a paper and, and a conference presentation, it's, it's hard to always put everything in there that you feel needs to be in there, especially when we have such short time, uh, but obviously we need, we can't uh, have more time. Um, we can only stay on Zoom so long. Uh, uh, in terms of your creation of the indicators for vulnerability, um, it seems to me a lot of secondary data was used and I think that's great, a secondary, sorry, sources. So in drawing on the existing sources and, and, and you've got a great table of that in the paper. Um, and, but I also think more uh, UN sources would be valuable here that are sort of like setting the bar. You know, what is the bar? compared to thinking about what's in the law in Israel uh, versus thinking about what's in the bar uh, in terms of normative uh, frameworks on, on labor rights and human rights. So if you're looking to ILO and looking to ICRMW, uh, because there's some pretty strong guidance in there about what should be the parameters of labor migration. And, and so, uh, so that's one thing. And then also, as you know, I do some work on housing and, and found like a lot of the key issues that affect migrant workers housing, like overcrowding, um, uh, refrigeration and food, uh, uh, potable water, uh, communication and transportation, they weren't clear to me as things that were considered in your indicators. So, um, and I, I don't wanna add more indicators, but I think, I think maybe differentiating what you did include and what you didn't and, and sort of uh, going forward, how to maybe uh, further expand that. Also other things that could be included, uh, include things like uh, other measures of integration, such as access to, to residency, um, access to services, et cetera, um, more broadly in the community. Um, and so, I mean, this is the challenge also with the use of indices, right? Like I've used them before too. I create a housing vulnerability index for migrant workers and agriculture in Canada. And, it was a real challenge to do because you're, you know, you're, you're combining all this stuff together. And I think sometimes it's really valuable because you get this great sort of what's a pretty powerful finding, right? You've got, you know, you get what feels like statistics that you can, you know, really rely on and tell people that they've, the index has shifted and changed. But sometimes I think it obfuscates other types of information. And so just knowing the frequencies um, would be really valuable. What was the average wage before and after? You know, and some of that can come from policies, like just telling us what was different in the policies and then how it changed in practice um, and laying that out, I think could be really valuable. So um, my last final note would be, I'd be remiss if I didn't say something about gender. I'd love to hear uh, a little bit more from you about um, about how you think gender might have impacted uh, the, the realities on the ground here to think, taking a step back to think more broadly about uh, structural inequality. So anyway, thank you. I really enjoyed the paper and look forward to a discussion. Thanks. Thank you uh, very much, Jenna. So I'll, I'll let uh, Rivka and Nona, if you want to quickly respond yes. and then we'll, we'll open it up for yes. questions. Okay, I will, I will start. So thank you very, very much, Jenna, for for your comments, so I think that you 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 pick the one of the the issues that we were struggling with. So the differentiation between the precariousness and the vulnerability. Okay, this is something we need further to to learn to to decide. But uh, Yes, this is a, this was an, an important issue that I I felt personally that is not a clear cut and uh, so uh, thank you for the tips uh, you gave us. Um, you, you know, we uh, when we started the um, this project, um, we we had was was several questions and then. Uh, of course, we didn't. When we um, starting with the monitor uh, monitoring this this project, we tried to uh, ask the same questions in order to have the before and after measure. Okay, so we added other questions, but we don't have the possibility of comparing. For example, you are right, and we are um, that uh, uh, many of the indicators of the living conditions. Okay. So uh, are not the ideal living condition, the ideal items, okay? 
so um, you, you are right, but uh, in order to make this comparison, we, we have to work what we have. Uh, um, regarding the gender issue, well, uh, construction workers are only men, okay? So it's impossible to have a, a gender perspective. And most, what? Sorry, I was just going to say, you can always have a gender perspective, but there's men or women. So just, I was just. Uh, okay, but, but we, we can we, chat about having it. Yeah. We, so, so we, we don't, uh, most of the, so cause agriculture are all, all, also mostly men. There is a small percentage of women. We could in the, in the agricultural sector have a gender perspective, but we have a very small number of cases so from the perspective yes 92 percent uh, yeah, yeah. women so so uh, in order to to it's impossible but we know of course and we i, I think yahel discusses these issues about for example they're very clear in the living conditions okay so women don't don't having the required living conditions okay so uh, uh, living uh, with, other, with other persons, don't having a, a bathroom for them, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, you are right, okay? But we don't have a, 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 must, enough, in, in enough cases to make the comparison, okay? So uh, regarding this issue. Um, Regarding the, uh, Nona, could you explain how you, uh, the issue of the wage, how you calculated it? Because it- Yes, the wage, uh, low wages, uh, uh, this indicator was calculated as a ratio of the minimum wage stipulated by uh, law in Israel uh, to the salary uh, received by the worker. So uh, the higher was the indicator, the closer uh, the salary of the worker was to the minimum wage. So, and, and we should say that uh, we were inspired to, to construct this uh, index of vulnerability from a paper, uh, an last paper, okay? Your, your paper where you suggest what are di the dimensions and so, so you, you encourage us <laughs> unknowingly uh, uh, to build this index, okay? Because in, 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 other, in other papers, we don't use uh, index of vulnerability, but um, okay. Regarding um, Another so I'll just say that in order to have more questions. Oh, okay. Uh, if you, okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna take, and that's gonna be a lot, but we're gonna take four questions together and then let you respond so we can go, uh, we'll have time for a little break. So we'll begin with uh, Pia Siri. Uh, thank you very much. It's a fascinating paper, of course. I am uh, familiar with your work uh, because I have been using them in my training courses because there are very few valuations. One major contribution is the generation of primary data. We look at, we review text of bilateral agreements. We talk about, we theorize about them. But uh, actual on the ground data, the main problem in my, what I found in my research is the lack of implementation of bilateral data agreements. In that sense, this kind of data is very important. And one issue I want to raise is actually, now, when you discuss vulnerability, uh, Jenna also mentioned this vulnerability, what, you know? I was wondering, I mean, whether the nature of the employer, I mean, you don't say anything about them. The, does it make any difference, you know, what type of employer, you know, a large employer, small, medium scale, but, uh, and also can these workers organize, I mean, is it, are they allowed to join trade unions? And the second point I want to raise is actually the findings are very depressing, you know, <laughs> instead of improving, the BLS have worse on the situation, you know, it is, uh, because I always argue that, you know, uh, deficiencies in BLS can be compensated by good governance systems in the uh, destination countries. Uh, 
but in the case of israel it does not work although they have strong labor market institutions strong labor laws etc it does not seem to benefit the workers because in the gulf countries uh, no democratic uh, democratic traditions and other things so there is no good governance systems whereas north south agreement this seems to work uh, so my last question is uh, so there is really lack of commitment to labor inspection uh, supervision and enforcement of labor law so how can we break this vicious circle i mean uh, israel government is very good on recruitment you know re- addressing recruitment malpractices can they address these uh, problems in the workplace what kind of action can they uh, take thank you very much okay so ah another question right let's let's take some more uh, yuval thank you so much for this uh, important research i'll be it uh, depressing as a uh, <laughs> commentator before me said um I, i i found it interesting that you didn't start the article with any hypothesis so you just delved into uh, uh, checking the situation mm-hmm. and uh, i was wondering if uh, 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 maybe there could have been an hypothesis based on uh, uh, um, things happening uh, documented in Israel in the past. Um, so, so we see one of your findings is that there is a relation between uh, 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 recruitment fees and protection of labor rights. So when there uh, was a decrease in uh, recruitment fees, uh, there was also a decrease in the protection of labor rights. And for example, the salaries went down, a decrease... Of, la- of recruitment fees and uh, correlated with decrease of wages. And this is something that actually happened in Israel or other way around this correlation was found in Israel in the past, at least documented by NGOs. So for example, uh, 10 years earlier, for, some, for different reasons, there was a change in the, re- the regulatory system in the construction sector and the Chinese workers started getting better salaries. because uh, the government decided on mandatory extra, uh, uh, extra time. So each employer had to pay for another additional mandatory 25 hours per week and the wages went up. And we know that also the recruitment fees at the same time went up as well. This was documented. And one of the hypotheses made by NGOs, and there is some anecdotal evidence on that at least, Because NGOs are not academia and they don't know, do systematic uh, methodological empirical studies, but they did say, we think that some of the money from the recruitment agencies went to employers. So once employers had to pay higher salaries, they said, okay, we want to compensate ourselves. And then they wanted more recruitment fees. So they asked a higher percentage from the recruitment, recruitment agencies and then the recruitment agencies asked the workers for more fees. And this might have happened the other way around now. So when, the, possibly at least, when the employers got less recruitment fees because BLA has managed to fight that, they said, okay, so we're going to lower the wages because we don't get a cut from the agency for the recruitment fees. So there could have been some kind of a hypothesis on that. And you j- j- simply mentioned that there's no evidence as to such... There's no studies on that uh, issue. And I think at least NGOs have uh, uh, raised their voice on that in Israel. And maybe also this calls for another reason. Maybe you could have also uh, interviewed employers and asked, you know, try to get their angle or try to get, I don't know if they would admit taking money or not, but this could be something complement- interestingly to do as a as complementary research. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Val. Uh, Sudat? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, thanks for a really interesting paper. I know so little about Thai workers in Israel. Um, I guess I had um, one general question about how you imagine this um, index maybe being used um, in the future um, for either further research or lobbying for a change. And then the second question, I'm interested in debt and debt migration. And I'm thinking comparatively because I'm thinking about not just debt migration, but debt accumulated after migration and during work in the host country. For example, in Taiwan, recruitment agencies are allowed to lend legally and there's you know, a ceiling on how much interest they can charge. And 
So I'm just curious about, you know, debt, um, not just the debt migration of getting there, but during, um, you know, during their work there. And, um, and who do they owe money to? And I wonder if that could be included somehow, because if they owe money to their individual broker or they owe money to their employer or those kind of things. Thanks. Okay. So I'll just quickly ask another question and then we'll uh, move back to you to try and respond. Uh, I'll just kind of continue from Jenna's um, uh, comments about the structural issues. I will say that I think you know, that um, elements of vulnerability can also result from the immigration regime. And I think what is what is missing uh, from the vulnerability index are elements related to status, elements related to mobility. Ability, I'm talking about mobility within the labor market, ability to switch employers. Um, so elements like that, even access to the justice system, because uh, uh, you know that those are elements that that can be looked at, including issues. Um, um, uh, of, uh, of, of enforcement or ability to, uh, you know, to make a fuss about one's working conditions. Um, so I think those are uh, also elements that are, that are structural, that are part of the migration regimes. I think there are also others, isolation, individualization, the, the, and again, this brings back residency, it brings back, uh, back elements that relate to gender. So um, again, it's, uh, we know when we're making this list, it seems like maybe, you know, too many things need to be included, but just uh, thinking about the migration regime as well, I think could be very, very interesting and the limitation of it. Okay. So now uh, you can uh, respond briefly in okay. two minutes, if you can. <laughs> okay, so I, um, I will start. Um, for, uh, um, regard, uh, type of employer, okay? Uh, uh, I don't know if I... Pisaidi? Uh, Pisaidi? Yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah. Oh, thank you for... <laughs> for your, your comments. Um, yes, the type of employer, so this is a first draft, okay, of course, this is a no, it's not the final version. And we were thinking, uh, because uh, uh, in the case of um, construction, we have these corporations that they are the employers of the migrants. And uh, so not the the, the um, the, um, the construction uh, owners, the, the owners of the construction uh, business, uh, uh, they, they are not the employers, okay? So, so they, are, they are these big corporations that can be uh, easily, how do you say, inspect. Inspect by the state. Okay, so this could be, uh, as you uh, you said, you are. You don't have hypothesis, but we thought about uh, this could be for sure an hypothesis because you would expect uh, that uh, in the case of the corporations, okay, uh, uh, that it's a small number, okay, uh, compared to the employers in uh, in agriculture. So you could expect the situation be better in the construction sector compared to the agriculture sector where you have thousands of, uh, of agriculture uh, 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 business owners, okay? So this is something uh, we can develop, although um, um, in, in many cases we have found, for example, that in the case of the corporations, we have uh, uh, less uh, uh, compliance with the issue of extra hours, okay? For example, and in, the, in, this, in this case, what we find out that uh, the payment for extra hours was not made by the corporation, but for uh, the owner of the business, okay? So the constructor that uh, he, uh, he paid them as a bonus. So many of the workers did not know if they are receiving extra payment because it was presented by the manager as a, a bonus, okay? So I think that uh, we can uh, introduce here the type of employer uh, to see if it makes a difference. 
Uh, regarding, yes, we have. Uh, yeah, so maybe you'll have to take one more point and then we'll have to, to yeah, end okay. and again continue and wonder. Yes. Ah, okay, Yuval, uh, uh, what you said, the explanation, this is exactly what we wrote in our paper. Um, so this is the explanation we gave in our paper when we compared uh, uh, Chinese uh, workers uh, before the bilateral agreement and with uh, uh, Moldovan uh, workers coming after the bilateral agreement. So these were two different groups, but this was exactly uh, our conclusion, okay? That because they weren't receiving money from the, uh, from the recruitment process, so they lower the wages, okay? So many would say that uh, the problem is that uh, migrant workers that are coming now, they are, uh, many of them uh, don't have the same skills as the previous workers. And this is the reason, this is what employers say, okay? This is the reason. We didn't interview employers, unfortunately, but this is something we can do uh, in the future. Um, Thank you. Unfortunately, I'm afraid we're really